Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Concordia University, Wisconsin. It's 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the time set for convening WEC Energy Group's 2019 annual meeting of stockholders. I'm Gail Floppa, Executive Chairman of WEC Energy Group, and I will serve as Chairman for today's meeting. We're delighted to be back again at Concordia, and I'd like to again extend our thanks to the University's President, the Reverend Dr. Patrick Ferry and his staff for their always gracious hospitality. Now, before we begin our session today, I'd like to ask Katie Telford, a team leader in our Customer Care Center at Wisconsin Public Service in Green Bay, to join me here at the podium. Katie? Welcome. Thank you. One evening last March, Katie and her husband were enjoying date night at a Northern Wisconsin supper club. Sounds like you had a pretty romantic husband there, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> During dinner, their conversation was interrupted by a, a commotion at a nearby table. At first, Katie and her husband just heard another diner coughing, but a few moments later, it was clear that the man was choking. And that's when Katie jumped into action. With confidence from her training, she cleared the choking man's windpipe and literally saved his life. Here's Katie in her own words. Everyone around you has a family member, has a friend, they have somebody who loves them, and what can we do to help them get home that night? My name is Katie Telford. I'm a team leader at Wisconsin Public Service. My husband and I were having date night, uh, which we finally had with no kids, and it didn't involve a Menard stop, so that's great too. We were eating at a place, a uh, steak supper club. I don't think many people heard it, just because you know there's music playing, there's all this stuff going on, so it's, it was one of those things where you're like, okay, nobody else is getting up, this is where I go and I do my thing. Walking up to him, you could see lips turning color, you could see face was purple. I went over and asked if I could take over, and then provided a a couple of thrusts a little bit above the abdomen, um, above the belly button, below the rib cage, and was able to get the steak up. I told Corey, my husband, that before I did that, I'm like, hey, you know, if this ends up happening, I need you to call 911, and luckily we didn't have to do that, and the gentleman was able to walk away. They asked for a safety share at the beginning of our morning meeting at 845, and I said, um, yeah, I have a safety share. Safety is more than a habit. So it's safety is an expectation, it's an expectation at work, and it's an expectation at home. Something the company sticks behind, and that's just fantastic. It's a, quite an honor to be recognized, and again, I feel because it's it felt like something that happened so quick and so sudden, and for it to get this much attention is very humbling. As Katie said, we take safety and safety training very seriously at our company because our employees work in dangerous environments every single day. And working safely and going home at night are more important than anything. But that training and safety awareness doesn't end when we leave work at the end of the day. Katie's quick thinking, her courage to act decisively in the moment, is a great example of why we work every day to promote a safety culture where living and working safely is indeed our top priority. Katie, in recognition of your heroic effort, I'd like to present you with this year's Chairman's Award. Congratulations. And in honor of Katie's life-saving efforts, the Wisconsin Public Service Foundation will make a $5,000 contribution to Katie's favorite charity, the Okada Area Humane Society and Animal Shelter. Katie, thank you for your caring attitude, for the great work you do for our company and our community. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will please stand, Katie will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. All right. Well, I'm delighted to see all of you here this morning. I'd also like to extend a word of welcome to those of us or those of you who are joining us via our webcast. Our meeting is streaming live today at wecenergygroup.com. Now it's time to call our 2019 annual meeting to order. 
I've been given the inspector's report, which indicates that more than 88 percent of the company's outstanding shares are represented. This constitutes a quorum under the company's bylaws, and this meeting, therefore, is duly convened to conduct business. At the end of our formal program, we'll be happy to answer as many of your questions as time allows. As always, some of the information you will receive at this meeting is forward-looking in nature and is based on our current expectations. Our projections clearly involve risks and uncertainties, factors discussed in the company's latest Form 10-K and in future reports filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission could cause our actual results to differ materially from those discussed today. And now we'll begin our business session by introducing the members of the WEC Energy Group Board of Directors. I would please ask each director to stand as I introduce them and remain standing until all the directors have been recognized. And folks, please hold your applause until the end of the introductions. We'll begin with Barbara L. Bowles, retired Vice Chair of Profit Investment Management and retired Chairman of the Kenwood Group. Albert J. Budney, Jr., retired President and Director of Niagara Mohawk Holdings, Incorporated. Patricia W. Chadwick, President of Ravengate Partners, LLC. Kurt S. Culver, Non-Executive Chairman of MGIC Investment Corporation and Mortgage Guarantee Insurance Corporation. Danny L. Cunningham, Retired Partner and Chief Risk Officer of Deloitte & Touche, LLP. William M. Farrow III, Chairman and Chief Executive of Winston & Wolf, LLC. Thomas J. Fisher, Principal of Fisher Financial Consulting, LLC. J. Kevin Fletcher, President and Chief Executive of WEC Energy Group. Henry W. Knippel, Retired Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Regal Beloit Corporation. Alan L. Leverett, Former Chief Executive Officer and President of WEC Energy Group. Alan has a, a personal commitment and could not be with us today. Next is Euless Payne, Jr., Managing Member of Addison Clifton, LLC and Mary Ellen Stanick, Managing Director and Director of Asset Management for Baird Financial Group. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in a round of applause for all of our directors. <laughs> and now I'd like to recognize the officers of WEC Energy and its subsidiaries, as well as the union and management representatives who are here with us today. Our union and management teams work very closely together to address important company issues. Would you please stand? Thank you very much. I'd also like to introduce Susan Hogan from ComputerShare. ComputerShare is the company that serves as our transfer agent and registrar. Susan has been appointed as the inspector of election for our meeting today. Susan, where are you? Would you please stand? There you are, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> Susan assured me no Russian meddling, no hanging chads, nothing like that, right? No need for a recount? Oh, good. All right. Also with us today are representatives of Deloitte & Touche, Bob Gordon and Brian Daus. There are auditors, and they can answer any questions you may have about our 2018 financial statements. Gentlemen, would you please stand? There they are. <laughs> and now I'll call on our Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary, Peggy Kelsey, to report on the proposals that we have before us this morning. Peggy? Thank you, Gail. On March 21st, 2019, a notice of this meeting was sent to all stockholders of record as of February 21, 2019. As set forth in your proxy statement, there are three items on which stockholders have been asked to vote. Number one, election of 13 directors to serve for terms expiring at the annual meeting of shareholders in 2020. Number two, an advisory vote to approve the compensation of the named executive officers more commonly known as say on pay, and number three, ratification of Deloitte and Touche LLP as the company's independent auditors for 2019. <clears throat> we will now proceed with the vote for the 2019 annual meeting. If you previously voted your proxy, your vote has already been recorded. At this time, I would like to ask if there are any outstanding proxies that have not been turned in to be counted. If you have not yet voted, please raise your hand 
and an usher will pick up your ballot. Thank you. The vote is now closed. I've been appointed to vote all of the shares represented by the proxy votes sent in by our stockholders. I've submitted the proxy ballot that reflects your instructions to the inspector of election. The preliminary inspector's report has been completed. The following nominees for election to the board of directors all received more than 91% of the votes cast and have therefore been duly elected. Barbara Bowles, Albert Budney Jr., Patricia Chadwick, Kurt Culver, Danny Cunningham, William Farrow III, Thomas Fisher, J. Kevin Fletcher, Gail Klappa, Henry Knippel, Alan Leverett, Euless Payne Jr., and Mary Ellen Stanick. Each director will serve until the 2020 annual meeting. The proposal to approve the compensation of the company's named executive officers as disclosed in the proxy statement has received the affirmative vote of more than 92% of the votes cast. This say on pay vote was advisory and not binding. However, the board reviews the voting results and takes them into consideration when making future decisions regarding executive compensation. And third, the proposal to ratify Deloitte and Touche LLP as independent auditors from 2019 has received an affirmative vote of more than 98% of the votes cast. Deloitte and Touche is therefore ratified as the independent auditors for 2019. I will now turn the meeting back over to you, Gail. Thank you, Peggy. Peggy, thank you very much. Well, the formal business portion of our meeting is now adjourned. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just very briefly, if you have followed us over the course of the last few years, you probably know that for 2018, we had literally one of the best years in the history of this company. If you look at almost any meaningful measure that you would apply to gauge the progress and performance of a company like ours, we set many new records. And I'd like to just for a moment uh, walk you through the last couple of years because we've made some major changes in the last few years, really starting in mid-2015 with the acquisition of a company that a number of you are familiar with called Integris, which was based in Chicago. So we are now in our industry have become a company of very significant size and scale. And let me put a few statistics around that. We are a Fortune 500 company, and I believe in a couple of weeks the new listing for Fortune will come out, and I expect we will be in the neighborhood of number 350. And what that means is that from a standpoint of revenues, we would be one of the 350 largest corporations in America. We have about 8,000 colleagues who serve more than four and a half million customers across America's great heartland. We have assets of nearly $34 billion at this stage of the game. And with those assets, we are the eighth largest natural gas distribution utility in the United States. From the standpoint of market value, we are the 11th largest publicly traded utility in America with an enterprise value. An enterprise value basically means the market value of our stock and the face value of any outstanding debt. So our enterprise value is now approaching $37 billion. Here's what our service area looks like, just to give you a brief reminder. About 70% of our assets remain in the state of Wisconsin. So we provide electricity and natural gas to many, many customers across the state of Wisconsin and up into the upper peninsula of Michigan. That, of course, is our traditional historic service area. Then if you look just beneath Wisconsin, those little dots are a bit misleading because the two little dots represent People's Gas, the natural gas distribution company in the city of Chicago, literally with hundreds of thousands of customers. And the dot just above that is North Shore Gas, serving customers in the northern Chicago suburbs. If you look slightly to the east, you see the blue covering the southern part of Michigan. We have about 178,000 customers who receive natural gas from us across the southern tier of Michigan. And then off to the west, you see Minnesota. And Minnesota, we have natural gas distribution customers 
in many parts of the state, ranging from the suburbs of Minneapolis to Rochester, all the way to one of my favorite places, International Falls, Minnesota, always the coldest place in America. So that's essentially what our service area looks like, and again, 4.5 million customers. For 2018, we recorded the highest net income in our company's history and the highest earnings per share in our company's history. Our earnings grew by about 6.5% to $3.34 a share over what was the previous record earnings per share of $3.14 for calendar year 2017. I know many of you are very interested in dividends, and you should be. Uh, we now have been able to provide our shareholders to provide you with 16 consecutive years of dividend increases. And the flashing, dot, the flashing line that you see over there on the screen at 2019, our board of directors authorized a 6.8% increase in our dividend effective for the first quarter payments that you received in 2019. So 16 consecutive years of what we really believe is industry leading dividend growth. And speaking of that 16 year period, since we began raising the dividend again, I thought it might be interesting to show you the total shareholder return performance of this company compared to a lot of other uh, comparator, comparator indexes. So if you look over the 16 year period, ending at the end of 2018, you can see that the utility indices really had a pretty good performance over that 16 year period, led by the Dow Jones utility average, which on a total shareholder return basis was up over 500% during that 16 year period, again, ending at the end of 2018. Then if you look at the broader market indices, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, again, very strong performance, uh, led by the NASDAQ up nearly 500%, just over 494%. And again, this is total shareholder return, which means essentially the, the appreciation in stock price plus reinvested dividends. Our performance over that same period of time, 789%, handily beating all the major market indices. Another way to look at it is if you had made a $1,000 investment in WEC Energy stock at the end of 2002 and did nothing else, just let it ride, let the dividends reinvest. At the end of 2018, your $1,000 investment would have been worth $8,890. And if you look on the screen there, the blue is stock price appreciation, the green is dividends and dividend growth. So you can see the importance of dividends to total shareholder return. And one last statistic, uh, if you average out our total shareholder return over those 16 years, on average, for each of the 16 years, our return has been 14.6% per year. About a week or so ago, we announced our first quarter results, and we had a strong, positive first quarter, a great opening quarter for 2019. Our earnings came in at $1.33 per share, up just over 8% over the first quarter of a year ago driven by really three things. The first, and many of you, if you weren't in Florida, many of you were here for the polar vortex cold snap. It did get cold. Minus 50 degree wind chills in many parts of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and when our system was really put to the test, particularly our natural gas delivery network, I'm proud to tell you that we delivered. We delivered both strong, consistent, uh, reliability throughout that, cold, throughout that cold snap, and our customers set new record demands for natural gas across Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. The second reason we had a good quarter is actually the tailwind we're seeing from a strong economy. Unemployment in the state of Wisconsin has been at 3% or less for each of the last 12 months. That's a record in terms of record low unemployment in the state of Wisconsin. So the tailwind of a strong economy. And then third, just really positive, good efficiencies that we continue to drive across the system, very good cost management. So a great opening to the quarter. And as Kevin and I wrote to you in our annual letter, we have always believed that financial success can only be sustained year after year, decade after decade, by excelling at the fundamentals of our business and focusing on customer satisfaction. That's a core belief of this company, a core belief of this management team. 
And I would like to now turn the meeting over to our President and CEO, Kevin Fletcher, to talk with you about our progress operationally and some of our very important initiatives. Kevin? Thank you very much, Gail. Thank Appreciate you. that. Gail just talked about fundamentals of our business. And one of the fundamentals of our business is reliability. We Energy was named best in the Midwest at keeping the lights on for eight years in a row and 11 times out of the past 13 years. Now that's a testament to the skill and the dedication of our employees, to our focus on safety and the investments that we've made to ensure reliable service for our customers. Another key fundamental is customer satisfaction. Last year we were recognized as the best in the nation in J.D. Power's key account survey and we were ranked in the top quartile of investor-owned utilities in the American Customer Satisfaction Index. We were also named by Forbes magazine as one of America's best employers for diversity. Now this highlights our commitment to diversity and inclusion and our company was among a select group of companies in Wisconsin that were recognized. Others included Northwestern Mutual, Harley Davidson and Johnson Controls. I'd like to shift gears just a little bit now and talk to you about a very important initiative that we have underway and that's reshaping our generation fleet for a clean, reliable future. Reshaping our generation includes, number one, retiring older fossil fuel generating units, number two, building state-of-the-art natural gas generation, and investing in, in cost-effective zero-carbon generation. Now, taking, in a whole, taking as a whole, these changes to our generation fleet are expected to do three things for us. Reduce overall cost to our customers, reduce carbon emissions, and preserve fuel diversity. Now, I'd like to give you a recent example of the value of fuel diversity. And Gail mentioned it. On January the 30th, we had a polar vortex where we, where we saw temperatures that were in excess of minus 20 degrees and wind chills 50 degrees below zero. I'll report to you that's the coldest that this human has ever experienced. But during that time, half of the wind turbines in the Midwest were not able to operate because of that extreme cold temperature. But because of the generation diverse mix that we have, we were able to keep our customers warm and to keep our lights on. Now our generation strategy does reflect the commitment to environmental stewardship. In 2016, we set a goal to reduce CO2 emissions by 40% over the 2005 levels by 2030. And after we met last year, we announced an additional goal to reduce our emissions 80% by 2050. Now we've just published a brand new climate report and when you leave here today there'll be copies of it out in the uh, lobby and I ask you to get one of those and take a look at it to get a little bit more information on what I just shared with you in this particular club. Now I've been speaking about the electric side of the business. Let me shift gears again and talk to you a little bit about the natural gas side of our business and our focus on methane reduction. Today we're announcing a goal to reduce our methane emissions rate from our natural gas distribution lines 30% by 2030 from a 2011 baseline. Now let me give you a little context to that number. Our 30% goal is equivalent to taking 34,000 cars off the road. So where do we go from here? Gail showed this slide earlier, but I want to call attention to the fundamentals of our business again. We will continue to succeed excelling at the fundamentals of our business day in and day out. Now with that said, I'm going to invite three of my friends and colleagues to come join me on the stage if they don't mind. Uh, Scott, Charles, and Tom, if you'll come up. And while these gentlemen are coming up, and uh, as we get set up, I'll introduce you to the three gentlemen. Scott Lauber is our Senior Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer. Charles Matthews, President and CEO People's Gas and North Shore Gas, and Tom Metcalf, President of We Energies and Wisconsin Public Service. I have a few questions I'd like to uh, discuss with these gentlemen, and I'll start with Scott. Scott, I've had the privilege of being the CEO of this company since February, and yeah, in that new role, I've been able to travel with you and, and Gail and Beth Straka, and we've been talking a lot with our investor group, and we talk a lot about our capital plan. Uh, I'd like for you to tell us a little bit today about that five-year capital plan. Absolutely, Kevin. Our, our capital plan, just like you talked about earlier, is based on the fundamentals of the business. So when you think about the fundamentals of the business, we're talking safety, reliability, customer focus, and environmental stewardship. 
So the first and the largest piece we have is our gas distribution. And, then, and you hit on it with the methane goal. So not only are we replacing pipes, but we also have really good growth in our gas business. Right. So in right. Wisconsin, for example, we've had over 3.5% growth the last three years. And what we're seeing is customers converting from propane um, and fuel oil to natural gas, and our larger customers are also using natural gas to help them meet their environmental goals. So it's really been an um, a exciting time in the gas business. Now, I'm going to ask you to stretch a little bit forward. That's the five-year plan, but what's past five years from your perspective you can share with us today? Yeah, absolutely. Now, we're going to continue on the fundamentals, because if you drive the fundamentals, it just drives the business and drives the success of the company. And when you look at it, we've already touched on the gas business. I know Charles is going to talk a little bit more about that, and I see that continuing. On the electric side, and Tom and I have talked about it, We've got 70,000 miles of electric distribution, and some of that's getting to be 50 or 60 years old. So we're going to be renewing that and modernizing that part of the grid. Sounds good. And continuing what you saw earlier, talked about earlier, reshaping the generation fleet for a cleaner energy future. I mean, that's going to be the highlights. But when I look overall at our capital plan, we've got a long pipeline of good value-added investments. Very good. Scott, thank you very much. Charles, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, we've got a large project ongoing in the Chicago with aging natural gas pipelines throughout Chicago. Um, I'd like for you to tell me a little bit more about that project, but especially, especially talk to me a little bit about the safety and the environmental impact of what you're doing there. Absolutely, Kevin. Uh, we're actually uh, a little past five years into our system modernization program. Uh, and the system modernization program is a long-term initiative uh, to modernize our, our natural gas delivery system. Right. Uh, there are three components of it. The first component is uh, we're replacing cast iron steel, uh, cast iron uh, pipes. Uh, a lot of that pipe's been in the ground for more than 100 years, that's and that's amazing. hard to believe. But, uh, uh, and there's still about 2,000, approximately 2,000 uh, miles of that pipe that we have to take out of the ground. The second component is we're upgrading the system from a low pressure system to a medium pressure system. Right. Uh, and the third component, we're moving meters that are currently located inside our customer houses uh, to the outside. And we, we still have more than 600,000 of our customers with meters inside their house. So uh, that's what the program entails. Now, let's talk about the impacts on safety. Uh, as we you know, upgrade that system to, uh, from low pressure to medium pressure, and as we move those meters from inside the house to the outside, uh, we're, it, it, that will help us prevent the type of situation, incident, that occurred in Boston uh, little, uh, last year where we had one fatality and over 80 homes destroyed. Uh, from an environmental standpoint, uh, as we continue to take that older uh, cast iron uh, pipe out of the ground, uh, we will significantly reduce the methane uh, emissions into the atmosphere, and you've already talked about that goal, and, and certainly uh, that program will contribute uh, significantly to that program. Uh, but there are some other benefits as well. Uh, customers will benefit from being able to use higher efficient uh, appliances, right. uh, taking advantage of the medium pressure uh, system. Uh, as well as the convenience associated with now having gas meters outside their house as opposed to inside their house. Sounds like the fundamentals of the business, investing in the infrastructure, and obviously a lot of touch points with all the customer opportunities ahead. So thank you very much for sharing that with me. But with all that going on, from the construction standpoint, there's plenty of other things that we're involved in in the community. Tell us a little bit more about that, if you will, Charles. Well, well, well you're right. You know, obviously we're working hard with the SMP uh, project, but uh, we're having a lot of fun and doing a lot of good things in the community down there. Uh, when you look at the history of the two companies we have in Illinois, uh, the People's Gas, North Shore Gas. People's Gas more than 170 years old and uh, North Shore Gas more than 120 years old. So both of those companies have been parts, uh, part of the, the, the communities they serve for a long time. Uh, and Kevin, as you know, uh, community building is part of the We Energy's uh, DNA, has always been part of that DNA. So. Uh, uh, prior to the acquisition, as we sat down and started to talk about goals, uh, we, we identified as a goal community building, community engagement, just like we did for financial discipline, safety, and customer service. 
Uh, I am proud to say uh, that as a result of that effort uh, and that goal and, 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 and the initiatives we put in place, last year we partnered with more than 300 nonprofit organizations in Illinois. Right. Uh, but what I'm more uh, uh, proud of is the fact uh, our volunteerism. We had over 8,000 hours of volunteerism uh, from our employees in 2018. Uh, just last weekend in the snow, we had over 200 employees show up to help renovate a women's shelter. So uh, we've really uh, entrenched ourselves in the communities we serve. Now the slide behind your head is intriguing to me. Can you just tell us really quick what that's all about and were you a part of that? Uh, uh, Kevin, I absolutely, I've been a part of that. And, and this is one of the new initiatives that was part of our strategy uh, to engage our community. Uh, we started participating in the Polar Plunge, which is a fundraiser for Special Olympics. Uh, it takes place every year, not just when there's a polar vortex. Uh, and this past year, we had over 200 employees uh, actually participate in this fundraiser, uh, not just from uh, People's Gas, North Shore Gas, but vendors we do business with. Uh, employees from Wisconsin came down and participated. And Kevin, I'm looking for you to be down there next year. <laughs> well. Thank you, Charles. Look, uh, my wife, Tammy, and I happen to have a special needs child, and for all the folks like us that, that and have participated in Special Olympics, we thank you for that and for what you, you and your employees do every time. Tom, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, we recently uh, retired five coal-fired units in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, and brought online some new generation. As a matter of fact, in my talk just a minute ago, I talked a little bit about the generation reshaping and some of the new generation. Uh, tell us a little bit about what we're doing in the Upper Peninsula. I'd be delighted to, Kevin. Yeah, we just placed into service 10 uh, reciprocating internal combustion engine units, and uh, this is really an ideal solution for the Upper Peninsula because the units are dispatchable 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can call on them whenever we need them. Um, and in fact, those 10 units are located at two different sites. Mm -hmm. We have seven units located right near to Marquette, Michigan, and then another three units lo located on the base of the uh, Quinoa Peninsula. And those locations are important because they're injecting the energy exactly where our customers need it. We don't have to build any new transmission lines to support them. Uh, the other thing that I'm really excited about with these units, uh, Kevin, is their operational flexibility. They can go from zero to full load in just a few minutes. They're very fuel efficient. They burn natural gas, so they have a very small environmental footprint. Right. And they also have exceptionally low operating cost. In fact, on that last point, if you look at this solution compared with all the others we had, including continuing to run the Presque Isle power plant, which we've now retired, and looking at transmission as an alternative, this solution, and the shareholders should know, this is going to save our customers around $600 million over the life of the plant. And you mentioned one plant. We've actually closed four coal-fired plants since 2018 as we look at our new generation mix moving forward. Now, Tom, uh, speaking about new generation, I'm very excited about this next topic. Uh, we recently had approval from the uh, Public Service Commission for two new solar projects. Now, we're used to seeing solar on homes and in some smaller scale on uh, commercial and, and industrial buildings, but this is different. This is utility scale. Tell us a little bit about that. I'd be delighted. Kevin, yeah, again, this is an ideal fit for, uh, for Wisconsin because uh, these solar facilities will be injecting the capacity and energy that the state needs right when it's needed the most, in the middle of summer, on those hot, sunny days. And uh, we've talked a lot about the improvements in energy efficiency from, from uh, utility-scale solar. But we've got to remember that also we've seen a huge reduction in the installed cost, 70% right, uh, right. reduction in the last five years alone. Of course, the fuel is free, no emissions. So any generation we receive from these investments will offset emissions from fossil units. There'll be two locations. Uh, we'll have one site, it'll be located in uh, Iowa County in southwest Wisconsin. Uh, and that'll be known as Badger Hollow. Mm -hmm. And then we have a second facility up uh, uh, in northeast Wisconsin in the uh, Manitowoc and uh, uh, Kiwani County, excuse me. Um, both units of similar size. And t speaking of size, I mean, these are really impressive, Kevin. I mean, we're talking about together a million panels over around 3,000 acres, nearly $390 million investment. But it's a responsible investment. It's balanced. And if you look at their total generation, it makes up about 10% of Wisconsin Public Service's uh, total peak load. 
So it meets those objectives, lowering emissions, maintaining um, cost competitiveness, and fuel diversity. Which is why I said in my talk a minute ago, that's one of the most, uh, most important but exciting initiatives we have going on. Gentlemen, I thank the three of you for joining me on stage here today, and uh, to. you're dismissed. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you again, gentlemen. Now it's time for the question and answer portion of our meeting. Gail and I will be happy to take your questions. If you have a question or comment, please step to the microphone nearest you and attendant will assist you. But before asking your question, please state your name and city of residence for the minutes. We will also, also ask that you limit yourself to one question or comment so others may have the opportunity to speak during the time that we have together. Thank you very much. And Gail, I'll join you at the front for the first question. Oh, well, there we go. As Kevin's coming down, we'll explain how this will work. And it's a really pretty easy explanation. I explained to Kevin that if the question is hard, he gets to answer it. If the question's easy, I'll answer it. <laughs> it, was, it was something like chairman's prerogative, right, Kevin? Thank you, Gil. All right. Terrific. Who has the first question for us? Yes, microphone number two. Yes, I'm Terrence Brady. I have my share I came here, you know, as a result of, of your uh, integrous merger. So I, I came from the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, and I, you kind of limited me. You said only one question or comment, but I have a real quick, two quick ones uh, on, on the comment. I kind of like your meeting. Uh, it's, it's well presented, you know, the, the shareholder involvement. The one thing I would like to suggest is that you get more officer involvement in the social before. I've been in companies where people have sat down at the tables and talked to people and things like that. That would have been nice out there if I didn't have to try to hunt for an executive to talk to if, if you guys were more mingling. And uh, that, that's, that's just a, a suggestion. Just take it for what it's worth. Thank you. Uh, I think it would be a positive for your overall involvement. Uh, one quick one. I hope I can sneak in too. But uh, one of them is, is uh, you an answer quick. Uh, Mr. Koopa, is he listed as executive director rather than independent director? Because he, is he an employee or is it only because he doesn't meet the SEC requirements for independence? That, which, that should be just a yes or no answer. <laughs> which, which gentleman are you asking about? Uh, your executive chairman. That's of the board. me. That's you. Yes, that's yeah. me. That's, yeah, that's you. <laughs> Okay. I am. I am. An, I don't recognize faces yet. So uh, it's no problem. No, uh, I am. I am an employee. Yeah, you're on the payroll along with being uh, the chairman of the board. Uh, well, I, I do serve as chairman of the board. It's just called executive chairman. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I just question: Is it because you didn't meet the SEC requirements for independence, or you really are still an employee? No, uh, as you may recall, uh, I was CEO of the company for about 13 yeah. years. Stepped back to non-executive chairman. When, when Alan Leverett became CEO. And then unfortunately, Alan suffered a stroke. I stepped back in as CEO. And as we looked at how best to put together a great management team going forward, we decided to create something we call Office of the Chair. Kevin has become the CEO. He reports to me. And a couple of the gentlemen that you saw on, on, the, uh, uh, on the stage, Scott Lauber, Senior Executive Vice President, and Rick Kuster, Senior Executive Vice President. So this is, this is our way of moving forward post, okay. post Allen's stroke. That, that takes longer to answer than I thought it would. <laughs> OK, uh, my real question, I, I was really impressed. You, you I came here to understand the company, and you addressed it. Uh, you know, renewable energy was the thing I really wanted to understand. I just had a couple of comments on that. Uh, you mentioned methane reduction. As I understand methane, uh, you know, unless it leaks into the environment, once you burn it, it isn't methane anymore, it's CO2, it's a different problem. Is, so you, are your reduction, is that improving the distribution system and keeping it from leaking before it gets to the customer? Is that, is that what that project involves? That, that is correct. Essentially, we will be replacing older, in some cases, like Charles mentioned in Chicago, 150, 170 year old pipes that are leaking. And when they leak, they leak methane. So that, that's the solution to that particular problem, is, is leakage. On non-methane, you know, you had also a reduction in carbon emissions. And that one, I really, as a technical person, have a problem with. Because, I can, you know, I, what, what do you do when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining? 
uh, other than, I mean, the other ones I can think of, things like geothermal, nuclear, and hydro don't seem to apply to this situation. You, don't, you know, we don't have geothermal and there's no hydro here. I, I, it's the only ones I know of that, that are reliable and can be called on at any time, yet don't generate carbon. And how can you meet your reductions in carbon and still have a reliable energy distribution other than having enormous distribution systems, you know, bringing energy in from halfway across the continent or maybe from another continent to be able to have energy available 24-7? That, that, that's my real problem is, is you can't sh turn, off the, turn off the power like, the PA, like they do in California when they got a fire problem. You can't just turn off the power because the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. How do you get reliable, along with cost-effective energy, uh, when, when you know, if you limit yourself to non-carbon? Well, you've nailed you've nailed the the real issue. And Kevin mentioned that we've just done a climate report that's available to all of our share. It's available online, but also hard copies are available, Kevin, right outside. Right. And we've looked at a number of pathways, Kevin, that that potentially could help us get reliably to those kind of emission reductions. Kevin. Well, exactly right. And that's really what we were trying to convey just a minute ago. We, we have to be thoughtful about what and how. I mean, the fundamentals of our business is to make sure we can provide safe and reliable power at all times. Uh, but yet, from an environmental stewardship standpoint, we need to leverage every piece of technology that we can. So it's that balanced approach that we're looking at. And that's why we're doing the things that we just talked about with, uh, with the solar and with the wind. But the reality is days like January the 30th are going to happen again. Uh, and during those point in times, if we'd had every egg in one basket, so to speak, we could not have supplied the power that we needed to. Uh, now, with that said, really quick, the other thing we're looking at is that technology advances. If you're looking at the, the CO2 goal that we have and reduce uh, to the 80 percent by the 2050 levels, there's technologies that have improved and will continue to improve for us to uh, be a part of to reach that goal. But your observation is exactly right, and what we have to do is to be as smart as we can be about the balanced approach to provide reliable, reliable resilient, and cost-effective power to each of you. Very good questions. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, number one. Hi, my name is Foster Jensen. I'm from Oconomowoc. Uh, my question was um, the solar fields, are those like only during the summer or are those like work during the winter too? No, they'll work whenever the sun is shining. So essentially, but essentially, as I think Kevin and Scott mentioned, uh, and very much Tom's explanation I thought was great, if you look at the demand curve that we have, in other words, when, when does demand rise for electricity in Wisconsin? It's usually not in the wintertime. It's usually, we've set a new record demand for electricity in our history only on those hot, sultry, no wind blowing summer afternoons when it's 100 degrees on the lakefront. That's where solar shines, no pun intended. So that's the niche that we intend to use with these, uh, for these solar panels for our customers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, number four. Uh, number four. Uh, Tim Casey, I'm a resident of Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, but I'm here as a Director of Economic Development for the Waukesha County Center for Growth. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Clappa, and all of the WEC Energy Group leadership for your strong and continuing support of economic development efforts, I'm sure throughout all of your service territories, uh, but especially here in southeastern Wisconsin, which I'm more familiar with. Uh, we're a relatively young organization, uh, just coming up on three years old, uh, and the involvement of WE Energy managers uh, on our board of directors and in our committees as we form our organization, uh, build it up, uh, and strategize for how we're going to do economic development in Waukesha County is, has been integral. And uh, we energy support of uh, the M7, the Regional Economic Partnership, has been critical. Um, M7 has helped us on any number of projects in the last three years as, as we've continued our efforts in Waukesha County. And just quickly, I think one of the best examples of that might be uh, we're now working uh, with M7, uh, with WDC, with the City of Brookfield and other partners on the third expansion of Milwaukee Tool Corporate Headquarters at roughly 130th in Lisbon. And as, as you know, Mr. Clappa, uh, we've, we've worked with a company that's got a tremendous plan of action and a tremendous team. And in that time, they've gone from something less than $400 million in revenue to very close to $4 billion in revenue currently. And they've added over 1,000 jobs and as, as the newest uh, R&D 
and lab facility comes on, online here, uh, they'll add another 350. So just a, a tremendous growth story and something that um, M7 and the support that M7 receives from We Energies was absolutely critical in, in helping that project come together. So I just wanted to thank you for that and say that we look forward to working with M7, We Energies, and all of our partners in the future. Terrific. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the developments that are going on around southeastern Wisconsin, uh, there is a group that's forming that M7 has been involved with to drive economic development, jobs, growth, opportunity uh, in Waukesha County. And the Milwaukee Tool example that Tim just mentioned is just amazing. I mean, this company uh, has, has grown phenomenally. And with the work of people like Tim, they have, they have found a way to put R&D labs, uh, to put expansion opportunities all here in southeastern Wisconsin. These are great jobs and a company that, uh, that we're all proud that we've been able to help expand here uh, with real opportunity. So Tim, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. All right. Number three. Come on over here, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any questions. This is a comment. I'm a, uh, my name is Sister Ellen Carr. I'm a sister of St. Francis of Assisi. Welcome. And I am going to talk from this because otherwise I'll take up too much time. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and to speak on behalf of the Sisters of St. Francis of Assisi. I bring you our deep gratitude, our prayers, and our encouragement. Our sisters came to Milwaukee from Bavaria in 1849 to serve the German immigrants. In the 170 years since our arrival, we have devoted ourselves to meeting the needs of individuals and families. You may be familiar with some of our corporate ministries, including Cardinal Stritch University, St. Coletta of Wisconsin serving persons with special needs, St. Anne's Intergenerational Care Centers, as well as Juniper and Canticle Courts, which provide affordable housing for seniors on our Mother House campus on South Lake Drive in St. Francis. We are deeply grateful to We Energies for your generous contributions to our efforts to build a new home for our elder sisters. I wish to tell you about one of our sisters. Her name is Sister Margaret Gardner. Margaret is 98 years old or young. She is one of 80 sisters who will be moving into the new convent. She has been a Franciscan sister for 78 years. Wow. She was a beloved teacher. She continues to be our teacher. She was an avid gardener, I guess after her name. She loves nature and reminds us of the importance of our efforts to respect, nurture, and preserve Mother Earth. She is currently living on the fourth floor of our mother house which was built 104 years ago. It has no sprinkler system, open stairwells, a wooden frame construction, and no private bathrooms. Given her limitations, she must use a commode in her bedroom. By the end of May, all of this will change, thanks to your generosity and that of others Sister Margaret will move into an accessible, safe, spacious, beautiful, earth-friendly, energy-efficient home that has been designed to meet the needs of seniors who need assisted living and memory care. In addition to serving our sisters, we will soon welcome elders from the wider community. Sister Margaret recently reviewed your pathway to cleaner energy. She asked me to tell you that you are on the right track. <laughs> to thank you for your commitment to be good to Mother Earth and to encourage you to work hard to meet your goals. Sister Margaret had the reputation of being a pretty tough grader when she was in school. And I wonder if you have any idea what grade she gave your new endeavor. I'm hoping better than a D. <laughs> Definitely better than a D. All right, maybe Let's A minus. Let's go all the way up to an A plus. Oh, actually. all right. So that's pretty, pretty <laughs> good for her. 
Sister Margaret asks us to remember that to make a lasting difference for Mother Earth and future generations, we must all work together, for we are in this together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Just a quick comment. I, uh, we've gotten to know Sister Ellen. Uh, we've been a little bit of help in, in this project. Uh, if you have any, any interest at all in helping to fund this new mother house, it's a great project. Sister Ellen will be here. But, uh, but when, you, when, you, when you see the conditions that some of the, the great people who taught us throughout the state of Wisconsin are living in, in their retirement, uh, it'll break your heart. So we are so delighted to be a small help to you, Sister Ellen. And, uh, and I'm glad we got a good grade on our, on our yeah, climate report. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But she's going to be watching. She's going to be watching yeah. us, OK. <laughs> Has she retired her ruler? <laughs> Thank you very much. Kevin, where would you like to go? Number two, please. Hi, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Linda Flashensky. I live in Caledonia, Wisconsin, and my husband over here and I have been shareholders in We Energies for about 30 years now. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And my question is this, with all of the de demonstrated and profound negative impacts of coal burning on the health of our citizens, as documented by the American Lung Association and others, and the equally profound ne negative impacts of our air, water, and soil, why is We Energies and WIC, WIC choosing to wait for years, maybe decades? I have read your climate report and in the uh, addendum, you talk about 2050, to, to move to renewable sources of energy for the Oak Creek plants. Um, how can it be responsible to continue moving tons of coal by train with the coal ash falling all along the tracks and into the air and come all the way from Wyoming to burn at our Oak Creek plants when we know that coal burning is an outdated, expensive, and harmful practice which is deeply unfair to our residents and to our environment. Basically, why are you waiting so long for renewables in the Oak Creek area when other entities are moving forward? Well, I'll be happy to take a first shot at, at answering that question. I'm sure Kevin will have some thoughts as well. But let me be very succinct in the answer, because we have to keep the lights on. We have made, we are the largest investor in renewable energy in Wisconsin. We have over a billion dollars of wind farms. You heard about our commitment to new solar uh, installations in the best places in the state. But the truth of the matter is, and Kevin pointed it out, when we get into situations like the polar vortex, we have to have generation, we have to have power plants that we can rely on, whether the sun's shining or not, whether the wind is blowing or not. And so we have to have a diverse fuel mix. We have natural gas, we have hydro, we have, we have a nuclear power purchase agreement, we have renewables in wind and solar. We have a full array of power plant capacity that we really need, and, and you can just see what happens if you don't have that. Uh, I mean, we had in late January a life or death situation at minus 50 with the wind chill. You can't not deliver when people need it the most. So we will make great progress. Uh, we, we have a very aggressive goal. In fact, uh, Kevin, it's 40% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. 2030. Well, and Gail summed it up right. We, we, we have to be thoughtful and very careful about what and how fast we move forward. I mentioned technology just a minute ago. We're leveraging technology advancements, and you heard about that today. We'll continue to do that. But we also take very seriously our commitment to the environment. You mentioned Oak Creek, and you mentioned coal. Uh, you know, we, we had a, a situation, very unusual, but we've had some coal dust uh, that came across the, uh, some of our neighborhoods there, and we were very aggressive in dealing with that. Uh, what we've done is a couple of things I'll just add really quickly. We've put in some new monitoring systems. We looked at the operations of our plant, and uh, when we have those situations where we're seeing the wind come from a direction that it normally does not come from, uh, and the volume of wind is such that it causes 
some dust. Uh, we began to uh, put more watering on our, our coal piles and on the, the roads around us. We trained our people to be very careful to watch that uh, and operate uh, differently as a result of what they're seeing in the wind direction. But in summary, though, I'll add to what Gail said. Uh, we're going to continue to be as aggressive as we can and should be, but everything that we supply, I'll repeat what I said earlier, it, it has to be reliable, it has to be resilient, and it has to be cost effective. May I just do one quick follow up? Um, you have closed or converted Green Bay, Pleasant Prairie, Madison. Why does Oak Creek, which, by the way, by the EPA, we are in a severe non attainment area for air quality, why does Oak Creek keep getting left behind in terms of all this coal going out into our air? It, it, well, first of all, the coal's not going out into the air. I mean, we have the most modern, efficient, state of the art environmental control systems in place at Oak Creek. But the, the real answer is. The new units that we built at Oak Creek that came online in 2010 and 2011 are among the most efficient coal burning power plants anywhere in the world. The plants that we've retired, and as Kevin mentioned, we've done four just in 2018 and early Since 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, those plants were older, less efficient. I mean, the new Oak Creek units and even the older Oak Creek units are always, in, in terms of our industry, among the most efficient, cleanest burning units literally in the United States and in most cases in the world. That's why. Thank you. Right. Yes, number four. Yes. Yes, I'm Dave Johnson. I'm from Cross Lake, Minnesota, but former a Minneapolis, Minnesota resident. Ah, well, Cross Lake is very near International Falls, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate no, you I, using our gas up there. Cool. You, well, we'll try. <laughs> My question is this. Many, many years ago, I came down to Manitowoc, Wisconsin with my father and Mr. Wrench and his son, Wrench Jr., and watched that company change from manufacturer to natural gas. Then a few years ago, we were stockholders of Integris, and then you bought us. I'm very proud of what all the board and you people have done. But I think we need to stress two things. Right. What you're doing to clean the air, which is wonderful. I'm very proud of you. Also, I think the natural gas industry needs to stress how much more efficient the furnace today is mm -hmm. than it was in 1940. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Keep up the great work. Right. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Gail, let me add really quick. We're very involved in the eight agencies like the American Gas Association, and I have the privilege of serving on that board. The things that this gentleman talked about is what we're looking at, in addition to just the supply of natural gas, the efficient use of natural gas. So thank you very much for your comment. Very good. Number two, please. Good morning. I'm Howard Hadley, a veteran resident of Lannan, Wisconsin. Welcome. Thank you. I'm privileged to represent the Stars and Stripes Honor Flight Organization and to thank you for your very generous support in the past and in the present. Just a little bit about me. I'm from a military family that served in the Civil War to the Vietnam War. Wow. I think we had more hair in the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was an Army captain, infantry captain, World War II, wounded near Iwo Jima. My older brother and I enlisted in the Air Force right out of high school. My dad gave my two younger brothers an option, either join the Marines or go to jail. <laughs> I think my younger brother should have gone to jail. <laughs> but the Marines took care of that, so Semper Fi. I served 25 and a half years, first as a jet mechanic, and later as a flight engineer in Vietnam. I flew many humanitarian and operational missions in Vietnam the United States and all around the world. I've only been to Washington, D.C. twice. First time with my dad when I was 10 years old. Was I thrilled when he marched me up 898 steps to the top of the Washington Monument and back again? The elevator was working. <laughs> and to take a 10-year-old boy to a dusty museum to look at mummies and rocks. Mm -hmm. Rocks. Really, Dad, what were you thinking? 
My last trip to Washington was on a Stars and Stripes honor flight in April of last year. It was a day I will always treasure. From your generosity and incredible support, you at Wisconsin Energies have given our World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam veterans two amazing gifts. First, an opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C. and visit our memorials, including our most sacred shrine, Arlington National Cemetery. You gave us a time to honor and remember those who sacrificed their lives for us and for our great country. Second, a healing experience, an opportunity for many, many of us to heal from the psychological and emotional scars of those wars. For that, we are eternally grateful. Camping our day was a return to Milwaukee to literally thousands of family members, friends, and well-wishers, reminding us that we are not forgotten. Again, we at Stars and Stripes Honor Flight Organization thank you for your generosity, unwavering support, and for sponsoring our 51st flight on May 11th with 172 veterans ah. on board. And I salute you. And thank you, sir, for your service. Yeah, let me add really quick. Uh, Charles Matthews and I, several years ago, had an opportunity to go on an honor flight as a guardian. And I will tell you, it was one of the mean, most meaningful opportunities I've had and a growing appreciation for what you and so many veterans have done for our country. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you. <laughs> Number two, that's a, uh, our favorite microphone today. Yes. Good morning, Gail. Good morning, Kevin. I'm Joe Dean from a shareholder of Port Washington. Um, also, I have to say, through the grace of God, my wife and I were founders of Stars and Stripes Honor Flights, so let me again you thank We Energies. You were there from day one, 10 years ago. Howard, thank you for your remarks, and to all the veterans in this room, thank you for your service, and, and welcome home. And, Joe, um, and this guy won't take all the credit, but what a phenomenal job he did in putting this volunteer organization together. It's just phenomenal. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. It's an honor. Um, last year, I came and thanked the We Energies Foundation for this book, uh, My Dog Named Hope, with uh, thanks to the generosity of We Energies. All the proceeds went to kids uh, battling cancer. And uh, since then, I wanted to let you know the book's won two national awards, including wow. the uh, Young Adult Children's Best Book of 2018. None of that was possible without the We Energies Foundation, so thank you for that. Wow. And uh, based on the popularity of the dog in this book, um, who befriends this little girl with cancer, and the dog is named Hope, of course. We are coming out in June, again, thanks to the We Energies Foundation, with a plush version of the puppy, of the Hope dog. This will be donated to hospitals throughout Wisconsin, and then we're going to also sell it. It's a 100% volunteer effort, and all the proceeds will continue to go to kids and families uh, in the fight of their lives battling cancer. And what the medical community really likes about this dog is that it has a, uh, an insertable hot and cold pack uh, that they can ah. use. And so when kids hug the dog uh, as they go through their chemotherapy treatments, they'll get relief at the, at the stint and some of the pain they're in. So I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, I mean, it's just such a blessing to have all of your employees as, as part of our community. And thank you for your generous hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Mm. Well, I believe, and I'm checking with Beth, I believe that for all of you, we have, we have copies on the way out. Uh, if you'd like to take one of the, one of the Hope books, it's, it's worth taking home. Uh, Joe did a phenomenal job on this. It's, it's a children's book that the children can, can read through as they're getting their cancer treatments. Excellent. It's fantastic. Well worth it. Joe, thank you for what you're doing. All right, I think we're at number one. Hi, my name is Nancy Horvat. I'm from Muskego. And first, I'd like to thank you for um, your wonderful year that you've had and all the years that you've had. Um, and I'm really excited about 
your investment in solar. That's something I've been passionate about since I was a teenager, so I'm really excited to see that it's able to be used at the utility level now, and that's wonderful. Um, I do have a question about how solar is impacting the business, and I'm talking about the solar that the homeowners are doing. For example, there's this subdivision in New Berlin that's going up that's got fully solar generated homes, and I believe they're selling back enough to cover their electric bills, or maybe more. I know that's a good, you're, you're buying that generation and sending it to others, and I know that's a good um, factor for you, but my question is probably like a long-term look at, are you um, looking at the uh, potential that this has to, um, uh, disrupt is probably too strong of a word, <laughs> but um, for your, your current business model and looking at the, those potential things and what uh, plans do you have in place and how confident are you in those plans? Well, great questions. We have two and we'll let Kevin give you the details. In addition to what uh, Tom and Kevin showed you in terms of the major solar fields, the major solar farms that we're investing in, we also just got approval in the last three, four months from the Wisconsin Public Service Commission for two different types of solar projects that would involve neighborhoods, school systems, et cetera, Kevin? Yeah, the Solar Now program does exactly that. If you have interest in, in participating from a commercial, especially a commercial or a nonprofit or a governmental installation, then uh, we'll actually provide the, the, the panels if you provide the roof or the location. And, and that way, the, the synergies around uh, and, and the scale you have is a, a better way to do it to help us and helps the citizens as well. There's a second program uh, dedicated uh, to a larger scale uh, projects like uh, like talked about in the neighborhoods. Uh, it w we don't see that as disruptive. We see that there's niches for that. So what we've chosen to do is try to find a way through our pilot programs to find out, learn more about that, to find out how we can continue to do better and moving forward. Utility grade solar, though, which we talked about, though, it's about the economics, too. So these projects and these proposals, at the end of the day, it has to be cost effective. So what we found out in utility grade solar, that we, again, what we talked about, that's going to be the best way for us to provide solar power to our customers across a wider range. But thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Okay. All right, back to number two. Uh, three quick ones. Uh, last week, scientists from NASA said 2018 was the first year since 1820, about, where the carbon dioxide manufactured by the United States decreased. So that's good news. And then uh, I was interested in uh, people's gas and uh, northern gas with all the flooding in Chicago, I worried about the electric, but I don't think they touch electric in that area. No, we're, we're natural gas distribution only. Okay, good news. And uh, <laughs> last one is... And Charles has got a scuba deal. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I worried about it when they said they were going there. Anyway, uh, uh, what do you know about carbon dioxide capture? That's coming up now. Okay. All right. You got to know more than I do. Well, <laughs> a great question on on capturing uh, carbon dioxide. Actually, Kevin, I think it was probably six or seven years ago now. We were part of a first ever experiment uh, that the Electric Power Research Institute, which we're a part of, uh, first time out of a laboratory where there was a new technology that could capture carbon. Uh, it used ammonia and several other basically proprietary techniques to capture carbon. And we did a pilot on one of our coal-fired power plants. It worked great, but the cost was horrific. So the real issue now, I mean, there are technologies that can capture carbon. There's no question about that. But cost-effective is a whole other issue. and. There's one other problem that has to be really solved once you capture the carbon, and that is what do you do with it? So right now, the only, the only viable technology, the only viable technique once you capture carbon is basically to bury it. You inject it underground. 
So this whole, this whole issue of capturing carbon and storing carbon, uh, we're a long way, I think, Kevin, from getting there in terms of anything that can be commercially available that would be at any kind of a price that you could, that you could deal with, number one and number two, then there would have to be a lot of legal changes to be able to transport carbon to store it in other states. The geology of Wisconsin will not allow us to store carbon. I'd just summarize by saying we're talking about utility grade solar today because we've seen technology advancements and cost per unit go down. I think carbon capture and other things like battery technologies will continue to advance over time. Uh, we're involved in industry uh, uh, agencies and opportunities that are studying that, like EPRI will continue to do that. Thank you very much for your observation and your question. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, back to number two. I just wanted to join the popular mic group, I think. <laughs> um, so, Kristen Geese, Executive Director over at the Mequon Nature Preserve. I uh, just quickly wanted to say thank you. Uh, Mequon Nature Preserve is 444 acres, largest protected green space in southeastern Wisconsin that is free. So if you haven't been there, please come, we're free. Uh, free and open to the public. And I wanted to say thank you, because as we strive to take farm fields and restore them into hardwood mesic forests and engage the youth and the community instilling that environmental empathy, you've been with us for over a decade of support. So annually, you support us through grants and wonderful generosity as well as, uh, I guess what would the word be, um, place someone on our board as well to help support us in that environmental initiative. Many large companies uh, tend to overlook their environmental impact. They tend to overlook uh, the little guys working really hard to plant those trees, but you guys don't. You're with us. And I just wanted to say thank you so much because we could not do it without you. Well, thank you well, thank you, thank you for your great work. We appreciate it. Number two again. It's a popular number, yeah. even number. Hi, my name is Mary Jo Fezenmeyer. I'm from Lake Geneva. I've actually owned stock for over 35 years. All right. You so when, I, you were, when, you bought, when you were four. About, yes, thanks. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Governor Evers has proposed a 100% carbon-free electricity goal by 2050. Xcel Energy has committed to a 100% clean energy goal. However, your stated carbon reduction goal is only 80% by 2050 from 2005 levels. Should investors be concerned that WEC is behind the curve, and what plans do you have to consider a 100% scenario? Thank you. Great question, and Kevin should give his view on this as well. First of all, let's talk about Excel. Uh, our, one of our neighboring utilities and committing to 100% renewables by 2050. Uh, the CEO of Excel and I are good friends. His name is Ben Folk. I know Ben very well. And I called Ben when I saw in one of our trade publications that he had committed to 100% reduction in CO2 by 2050. And I said, Ben, tell me about that. How are you going to get there? And he said, well, the media kind of missed the asterisk. He says, we think we know how to get to an 80% reduction, and we think with technology improvement, we can get to an 80% reduction. But essentially what he was saying was, we would have to get the technology improvement that we don't know exactly how we're going to get yet today for them to meet their goals. So I would say what Ben was doing was aspirational, but he doesn't have a roadmap to get there, nor do we. Now having said that, 2050 is a long way away. And as Kevin said, there's been a tremendous amount of technological improvement. So we have no problem with trying to get to 100%, but we have to balance that against our responsibilities, Kevin, of reliability and, and electricity and energy that people can afford. The only thing I'll add is, uh, look, by training, I'm an engineer, and Gail says he may forgive me for that one of these That's days, exactly. but I doubt <laughs> that he will. But I haven't yet. I know you won't, and you probably <laughs> never will. But, <laughs> My point is we want to be transparent about it. So uh, what we've established in the 80% goal by 2050 uh, is the best of our ability and a pathway, and you can read in our report when you leave today, some of the paths that we have to get there. But I'll, you know, I'll just repeat what Gail said. It's all about the technology and the ability to leverage technology. I will assure you that when technology is ready and the price points, along with reliability and resilience, are there, we'll be on the same wagon. 
statement. Just a follow-up. If we're going to use an asterisk, maybe you can make it 100 percent then instead of 80. Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'd rather not be misleading, but thank That's you. Right. <laughs> All right. Have we worn everybody out, Kevin? Ah, no, we haven't. Microphone two again. Hi, my name is Julie Heller, and I'm from Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Hello, Julie. Hello. I'd like to thank you for outlining what you've done and what you plan to do to protect the environment. I think it's great that you've set such aggressive goals to reduce carbon and emissions in a way that makes sense for us as customers. And as a lifelong Oak Creek resident, I'd like to thank you for the improvements that you've made at that site in particular, and for the investments that you've made in the community. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. Very much. All right. One more time. David Schmidt from Brookfield. Hi, David. Why does the cold weather affect wind generators? Well, that's really interesting. And now Kevin's the engineer. Let me give you the uh, <laughs> let me give you the layman language version of it. Apparently, now remember we're talking about steel towers 300 feet in the air, and then you have the blades hanging off those towers spinning. And my understanding is, and, and really this surprised the industry when we had the polar vortex cold snap in late January. Uh, apparently, at more than minus, Rick, is it minus 20? Minus 23. Minus 23? Mm -hmm. At more than minus 23, the steel in those towers gets so brittle that if you ran those blades, it could crack the steel towers. Is that a fair summary, Kevin? You have your engineering degree now. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is a good question. I'll tell you, it's something that we didn't expect, uh, not to belabor it too much, but the day before the polar vortex, it was a very windy day, as you may remember, and I remember driving home uh, that night uh, we spent the day thinking about our gas business and we making did. sure we were prepared. In my mind's eye, we were going to have plenty of generation on the, the wind side because the wind was blowing so hard. To find out when we came in the next morning, minus 25 degrees, and again, as I said in my talk, half of the wind turbines weren't able, were not able to run. Now, I will tell you that the industry, going back to the technology discussion again, they're evaluating that very closely to see what, what is the number. Is, what's the magic number? Is it minus 20, minus 23? So with what just happened, there'll be a lot more work studying about what could and should be done to give us more flexibility. Right. That's a good question. Though. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. And what's, is there a difference in the sun rays during the winter and then the summer on those solar panels? Is, does it put out more when the sun's further south, you know, in, in the cold? No, not really. The difference is in the angle of the sun. but. Other than that, Kevin, I don't know of any difference. Maybe a little bit, looking at my expert here on the right, but the reality is uh, the value of the solar for us during the uh, during the summer period is w when the sun is usually out and it's the, the warmest, that's when we need the capacity to the most. We can and we'll use it in the winter months, but it's not as critical for us and as helpful from a cost standpoint as it will be in the summer periods. And the sun will help melt all the snow on the, on the panels in the wintertime. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Well, Kevin, I think we'll wrap it up. Very good. Deal. Well, again, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our 2019 annual meeting. We really appreciate you being here, your great questions, and your participation. Please be assured that our management team will work hard in the year ahead to uphold your confidence. Again, thank you very much. Drive home safely. Have a great year.